just, just on my way to pick up Alan Phillips uh, at work station, running a few minutes late. Um, Alan is uh, the writer of a book on neo scholastic humanism, which doesn't sound complexly, but of course it's also about Robert Schumann. He's probably the only person to have written a book about Schumann in the last 40 years. So uh, it's very exciting that he's actually, uh, he doesn't even live in England, he lives in uh, Denver, Colorado. I just happened to get in touch with him via, um, well, it was uh, Alex O'Hara's um, suggestion. So I got in touch, just turned out he was visiting family and he's going back to America I think the end of this week. So anyway, here's the station. So And this is Dr. Alan Fimster, uh, has very kindly agreed to be interviewed. I don't know if anyone has written a book in the last 30 years on Robert Schumann, <laughs> apart English. from you, in English. So, uh, and it's amazing that Alan actually lives in Denver, Colorado, but I got in touch last week and um, it turned out he was visiting his uh, family in Newcastle. So we've, uh, he's very kindly come over to um, help us really understand Robert Schumann. I wanted to somehow, I never felt in when I wrote the book that I was coming close under the, under the skin of the man. Now you've read primary sources, you've visited his home, uh, where we'll be going with the documentary um, in about three week, uh, four weeks time. Could we um, get a sense? Well, give us, give us a summary, give us a summary of, of the man um, to start with, Alan, how you got in touch, how you sort of came to be involved. Well, I, uh, I was studying theology in Austria and I was contacted by a Belgian historian um, who uh, is a, has a great interest in um, the European Union and its origins. Uh, it's his area of specialism, but he had a sort of a private interest in, uh, in the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas and particularly of a, uh, a 20th century interpreter of Thomas Aquinas called Jacques Maritain. Yeah. And uh, he was interested in seeing how he had been involved and how his influence had, had, had helped to steer the creation of, of what was originally the European coal and steel community, which eventually mm -hmm. became the European yeah. Union at the beginning of the 1950s. And um, he asked me to, to help him look at that and, and uh, pursue doctoral studies in that area. And, and so, that was really your first, you hadn't wanted to, you know, this was suggested to you primarily. Yes, I mean, I was always interested in, in, in the question of European integration, um, uh, but, but it was, it was uh, his suggestion that I, that I take this up under his uh, direction. Yes. And I, I, I looked at three figures in particular, Alcide de Gasperi, who was a great Italian statesman, Prime Minister, and uh, Conrad Adenauer, who's uh, Chancellor of Germany. For many years after the war um, and who was voted the greatest German of all time in a national poll in Germany a few years ago. Um, and, uh, but uh, the third of these figures is Robert Schumann uh, who was both Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of France and actually initiated uh, the European communities uh, by the Schumann Declaration in 1950. Um, and uh, so I, 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 he, he, he seemed particularly to have been influenced by Maritain, um, although I must say that Alcide de Gaspi was very influenced by him as well. Um, but Schumann was, was the most determinative in that process. He's the one who, whose declaration began the European integration process and which is celebrated as Europe Day by the European Union uh, every year. And I suppose he as the man who wasn't German Mm -hmm. and wasn't Italian, wasn't a member of the defeated powers, Yes, was all important. So he was making the gracious offer yes. of reconciliation through the, uh, 
through the declaration. Um, but he was, in fact, all three men were, were men of the frontiers, as they say. Um, Alcide de Gasperi's political career had begun when uh, his region of Italy was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire yes. um, in the Austrian Parliament. Uh, Adenauer was uh, from Cologne, um, which was a, a traditionally Catholic region in the Rhineland, um, uh, but which had been taken over by uh, Protestant Prussia uh, after the Napoleonic Wars as a way of trying to balance the potential future power of France. Um, uh, a strategy that hadn't really succeeded because instead it just created an even more um, yes. intimidating force in, in the form of, of, of uh, unified Germany under Prussian leadership. Um, uh, so he, um, uh, Schumann, however, he, he was um, he, he was born in Luxembourg for a complicated set of reasons connected to the unification of Germany in, yes. in, in 1870 to 1871, when France under Napoleon III was defeated by Bismarck's Germany. And uh, Schumann's father um, had owned uh, family property in Lorraine, and, and the inhabitants of this region uh, of Alsace-Lorraine, which was transferred from defeated France to the victorious and now united Germany, was um, uh, the inhabitants were offered a choice either to retain their lands and stay in the region and lose their citizenship and become German citizens, or to uh, move out of the region, lose their lands, be compensated by the French government, retain their French citizenship, but be unable to yes. to live in their ancestral lands. Anymore. Just on that, I think I think his uncle kept the farm at Evranche mm. and stayed because I, I, he has a an early memory of the, the landmark of the field. Plow, he ploughed between two. It's a nice metaphor. Mm. It struck me as a novelist that he on, they, they would plough between the boundaries of two countries in one field on mm -hmm. his uncle's farm at Evrange, where he and he went there after when he went back after the war. He um, he was a it's complex actually that, but he I think he ended up going to Evrange for a period of time uh, directly after um, uh, the Germans were defeated. Well, Schumann, in fact, Schumann's father chose to retain his lands and lose his citizenship. So when Schumann yeah. was born, he was a German citizen, but he, d he didn't want to stay stay living in uh, the German province of Alsace-Lorraine. So he moved to uh, his wife's home country of Luxembourg, um, but, but as a German citizen. So Schumann was a German citizen when he was born. Um, uh, his father died quite early. He was a quite a lot young, quite a lot older than his wife. Um, and uh, and Schumann, um, Schumann pursued an education in Germany, various different universities, uh, and eventually studied law. But then he returned to Lorraine, to the town of Metz, which was the nearest uh, nearest yeah. big city uh, to where his family, his ancestors came from. And uh, and he um, was greatly influenced by um, what they call the social teaching of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who reigned from. 1878 to 1903 sure. and and had particularly promoted uh thomas aquinas as as a guide to uh catholic thought and political action and uh, and schumann embraced that tremendously under the influence of his mother read all the social encyclicals of, of leo the 13th which form this kind of um corpus and um and then he ultimately, uh, he ultimately began to get involved at, at a low level in Catholic political activity in, in Metz, in Lorraine. But, uh, but that all became entangled with the First World War. And finally, when he did enter Parliament, it wasn't the German Parliament, but, mm. the, uh, but the French legislature that he entered immediately after World War I. That's right. So that's very, very interesting. Was there a particular situation that politicized him and brought him out of just being a, 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 um, a city he was in Metz wasn't he practicing law uh, he set up his own business practice I think yeah. after finishing his um, was there anything that politicized him well he um, uh, in 1905 um, th there'd been a very serious problem in France uh, which was that um, uh, there was a great alienation between uh, the Catholic Church and the French Republic. Um, uh, a great controversy uh, regarding the monarchy, mm. because um, most Catholics, at least at the beginning of Leo the Thirteenth's reign, 
were uh, committed in France to the restoration of the monarchy, um, but but not by by no means all, and um, and this meant that they were divided and and therefore had very little political impact, and um, and anti-clerical forces that were very hostile to the role of the church in society dominated what's called the Third French Republic. Yeah. And they, they, they more and more diminished the functions of the church in French society, reducing the role of Catholicism in schools, um, forcing religious orders to leave the country. And eventually, after a, a terrible scandal uh, regarding anti-Semitism in the French army, Just the Dreyfus the Dreyfus, yeah, yeah. Gosh, yes. um, uh, there was a, a virulent period of anti-clericalism uh, which led to the 1905 law of separation, where, by which all the lands of the church were confiscated by the French state, and the French state cut off diplomatic relations with the Vatican, and refused to um, refused to have uh, refused to even recognise the Catholic Church as a legal personality um, in France. And 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 meanwhile, Lorraine, that this region that, that Schumann came from retained the church-state relations which had existed before the Franco-Prussian War and the transference of that province to Germany. So um, in the course of World War I, the French government had made pledges to the people of Lorraine who were in general inclined towards France, um, but were concerned that their religion would, would yes. suffer um, upon returning to, to French sovereignty. And so promises had been made to them to say that uh, if that did happen, which was, of course, a key part of the French war aims, um, they would be allowed to retain uh, a semi-established position for the Catholic Church in, in Alsace-Lorraine. So having got Lorraine uh, as part of France, did the French government keep that? They did, um, but uh, it was never completely certain that they would. And the French government is a difficult phrase because the French government was incredibly unstable during yeah. the Third Republic. There were many more yes. governments than the, years. Yes, that's yeah. right, I did. Um, and so um, so the, the people of Lorraine um, thought they needed people who were going to guarantee their rights and, and the honouring of those pledges. And so they elected politicians uh, for their region who, on a specific platform of guaranteeing the perpetuation of, of religious education in, in, in the schools of Alsace-Lorraine, and, and that was how Schumann was originally elected to Parliament. Okay, now, your specialism, which is mm -hmm. what we what we must talk about, is his intellectual formation. Because in order to explain that, I mean, I've come to this in the last year, so this has all been new to me, but to inter to the phenomena of Adenauer in Germany, Gasperi um, in Italy, and then Schumann, all, they're all drawing, as I find, from the mm. same fountain. You've already mentioned these papal, pap papal encyclicals. Could you, so this is one Pope responding to the specific threats of socialism and what he sees the forces of anarchy at loose in the world, and he's he's responding to the ideologies um, by in these letters he writes. And are they addressed to the, the world powers? Are they addressed are they addressed to some bishops? And how does that seep into popular? How did those letters come to influence three men who sort of rescue Europe after the war? Well, well, the big problem, which which Leo XIII is trying to address, is the fact that. Um, in the face of the French Revolution, the cause of, of Catholicism and Christianity in, in Europe has become irrevocably apparently associated with the restoration of the various deposed dynasties that existed yes. um, before the French Revolution and had tried to come back and, and, and with more or less success, uh, but less and less success over the course yes. of the 19th century and particularly in France. Um, and um, uh, and, and Leo was extremely concerned that uh, the, the, the cause of Christian influence in, in society and politics was being lost because it was being uh, tied to this, to this cause which is not itself inherently uh, significant from a Christian perspective. Uh, the, you know, 
Jesus Christ did not die on the cross in order to ensure that the Bourbon dynasty reign over France um, <laughs> until the end of time. Um, and, so um, he's not saying, I'm like the Congress of Vienna, defending the old powers. He's after something more general. Mm -hmm. What's he after? What, what does he want to impart to the powers of Europe? Well, he sees, um, he sees uh, Aquinas as the embodiment of the harmony of faith and reason. And he, he sees the, the, the role of, of, of temporal affairs and, and the lay state as the area in which reason is most active, but which it needs to, it needs to be harmonized uh, with the gospel and harmonized with divine revelation. So and not against reason as such, yeah, but reason, right. reason needs help. Yeah. Otherwise it could become the devil's whore as much as uh, our other faculties. Is that, I mean, we're trying to, I mean, it's so, now we need to take a step back again. Mm -hmm. We need to step step back. <laughs> Aquinas. This yeah. is what is it? A thirteenth century. Yeah. Thirteenth um, century um, friar um, uh, who uh, was taught at the University of Paris um, uh, and was very important in the uh, assimilation of Aristotle and his writings by um, the thought of uh, Western Christians. So this is helpful for people who are philosophy students. Mm -hmm. So this is a. A friar uh, in Paris, country. holding an academic chair in Paris for mm. 40 years, I think. And he's baptizing Aristotle for, um, for his generation. And then his work is then influencing a pope 800 years later, who is influencing politicians 40 years yeah. later. So let's, uh, do you want to say some more about Aristotle? Because I know this is, it is complex, but if if we can understand that, then you, you, in order to understand the well that certain men are drinking from, to make them such extraordinary human beings in the political sphere, where are they drinking? Where are they getting this steel, this uh, in a sense this lever from history that enables them to lever Europe out of a vortex of destruction and save Western Europe from communism? Uh, and we're going back to a Dominican friar in Paris. Uh, let's. Can you give us the simplest layman's explanation about why Aquinas is is such a um, such a power to be reckoned with. The early fathers of the church um, had been overwhelmingly influenced by Plato. So mm. in the Roman Empire the, the earliest writers about Christianity had been had been very influenced by Plato. Um, Aristotle had had less influence, his writings had not been widely disseminated in, in the Latin West. Yeah. Um, uh, during the early Middle Ages, and then suddenly in the late 12th century, they began to be uh, translated into Latin and make a make a, an entrance into the intellectual life of um, of the Latin West. That means not the the Chris part of Christian civilization that wasn't principally Greek speaking, yes. but, but used Latin as its. How did we language. get the manuscripts? Was it dialogue with Islam at that point? Were well, we... they they were they were. Um, they were first retrieved uh, from Islam. Islam had, had, had very, unlike the, the Western barbarians who had slowly conquered the Western Empire over quite a long period, Islam had very rapidly conquered the Eastern Empire, which was already much more cultured and developed and, mm. and wealthy uh, than the West anyway. And therefore, um, the intellectual culture of the ancient world had continued in a more continuous way in Islam than it had in, in Western Europe, where um, where uh, the the land was less settled and less civilized anyway, even before mm. the barbarian invasions. So we are digressing, but yes. what we're saying <laughs> is that um, Aristotle now is being called up in mm. the fight for Christ, being baptized, in a mm. sense, intellectually by well, he, this, this Dominican. It caused the discovery of these texts caused a crisis because the Western Christians knew how to deal with Plato, but they yes. didn't know how to deal with Aristotle. Yeah. And so it did something similar to what happened in the 18th and 19th centuries. That is, there seemed to be a self-sufficient uh, rational account of the world, politics, science, the fundamental principles of philosophy that didn't need and wasn't immediately obviously reconcilable with Christianity. Yeah. Um, and um, and there was a lot of panic in the 13th century about this and prohibitions on reading Aristotle at the University of Paris. And Aquinas uh, had shown a, 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 a sort of exquisite harmony between uh, Christian theology and Aristotle. Um, so that Aristotle came to be seen as, as, as almost a theological authority because he became seen as so... Yeah perfectly aligned with Christianity 
have it from a starting position where he'd been seen as a serious threat to it. Mm. And um, and uh, Leo XIII certainly saw um, Aristotle as a uh, as he saw the departure from Aristotle and from Aquinas as lying at the root of the um, hostility of of secular culture to Christianity um, at the end of the 19th century and he saw a revival of this synthesis of Aristotelian and uh, Augustinian and Christian thought that had been created by Aquinas as the key to reversing the kind of secularizing trends which were most extreme in France. Yes. And, and he, caught, he wrote nine, uh, nine encyclicals, oh, many encyclicals, more than that, but he wrote nine encyclical letters which were intended as a sort of programmatic um, uh, manifesto of, of the um, reconciliation of faith and reason and of the, the state and church. Mm. Okay, and, so let me have, so we, we, we've, you've given us a resume of, of this, the fountainhead of, the, of you know, coming from antiquity, Aristotle through Aquinas, just tell us a little bit about Leo, because he's an Italian patrician. Um, is there anything? It hel always helps me to to know the human being in a way, and he he cuts a noble figure, a bit like Gregory the Great, the uh, the Pope at the time of um, uh, the other subject of this documentary series, Columbanus. There's something uh, very noble about him. I I like his his styles. It's long. I've read the letters. Sometimes the uh, just, you know, just give us some background for for people that are coming to this fresh. Yeah, he um, he he was an um, he was a, an aristocrat from from the region of Italy around Rome. Mm. Uh, his family had been uh, very much involved with the the papal state, as it was called. Um, uh, he became a, a, a priest, and uh, his brother became a Jesuit priest. And, and a great scholar of Thomas Aquinas, and he had um, he'd risen in the papal diplomatic service, been a governor, and eventually bishop of Perugia. Um, and he, um, but he was a little bit out in the cold during the last decades of the previous pope, Pius the Ninth, um, possibly because he thought that the that the strategy that Pius IX had pursued had not been very successful. And I mean, that's, that's clearly the, how far one may, may or may not blame him for that lack of success. It, it's an objective fact that, that all the papal territories have been lost to um, the Italian... Right, this was uh, during the, yes, the yeah. unification of Italy. Yeah. Right. And, and it was a very anti-clerical regime. Mm. Um, and therefore, it, it's, it, it was a bit of a catastrophe in 1870, um, uh, it, it looked very much as if all was lost from the perspective of the papacy. They'd lost their states. The Pope was, as they called it, the prisoner of the Vatican. Um, the new unified Italy was very hostile to the church, uh, closing down religious orders everywhere, to confiscating schools and universities. Um, Germany had been united under the Prussians, uh, and, and Bismarck, the, the German Chancellor, had, issued, had begun a program called the, the Kulturkampf, yes. the struggle of cultures. Um, uh, to try and uh, break the influence of Catholicism in, in, in Germany. And uh, as we've already discussed, uh, things were going very badly um, in France as well. And so when Leo XIII became Pope in 1878, uh, he thought there needed to be a, 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 a reboot, essentially. And, uh, and he saw that the means of doing that as, as the, the philosophy and influence of Aquinas. Amazing. Uh, and so he wrote he, the, the first encyclical in his series of nine, he, get, he put them in systematic order towards the end of his life, was on the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. And then there was a sequence of encyclicals on the true nature of freedom, on the nature of marriage, um, on the origin of the state, um, on the proper relations between church and state, um, on socialism, um, on the uh, um, proper relations between capital and labour, um, uh, and um, on the duties of Christian citizens, and mm. I think on Freemasonry, I don't know if I mentioned that one. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so the um, uh, so so together, placed end to end, they constitute a kind of uh, Thomist political and social manifesto, and, and this is the, as it were, the ideology. Uh, um, lying behind the political action of these three men, which ultimately yeah. climaxed in the creation of the communitarian Europe in the early 50s. 
right? Okay. Um, so we've we've discussed, we've gone back. Aristotle, Aquinas, um, Leo the Thirteenth. Um, these letters are being read now. I now we know, don't we, that Adenauer was reading these at when he was on the run from the Gestapo uh, in Maria Lach. He was reading them there. Um, Schumann was reading these all the way through his university and his childhood. Yeah, and Gasperi. Well, I mean, um, they would have made an even more of an impact in Italy than they would have done yeah. in uh, France and Germany. Okay. And Gasperi was particularly influenced by Maritain. Right, now that's what we need to do then. We need to then come from Leo and see how, because we've got three names, haven't we, before we... So how how is that received in philosophical circles, those uh, during, during the 20th century? So you've got Maritain, Jacques, um, and... Etienne Gilson. Gilson. And uh, Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. Uh, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange was a Dominican friar from a, uh, a family who had suffered during the French Revolution. Um, and he was not, uh, while he was enthusiastic about the revival of Thomism that Leo XIII was trying to produce, he was um, not enthusiastic about embracing or rallying to the Republic. Uh, he, he was still very much um, devoted to the restoration of. of, of, of the uh, mm. Bourbon dynasty in France. Right. Um, uh, Gilson was also an enthusiastic Thomist, um, but he was a Republican, so he wanted a, um, a confessionally Catholic Republican France, which he appreciated was, um, uh, humanly speaking, unlikely, mm -hmm. but that was his genuine political goal, and, and he even served as a senator for the Mouvement Républicain Populaire, um, uh, that Schumann's, Schumann's yeah. political party oh, okay. after the war. Um, uh, Maritain started off um, uh, with the same sort of political allegiances as Scarigou de Grange, but when in the 1920s uh, the integral nationalist royalist movement Action Française was condemned um, as incompatible with orthodoxy mm. uh, by uh, Pope Pius XI. Maritain shifted dramatically to the left of the political spectrum, became a Republican, but not a not a, a confessional integralist Republican in the way that uh, Gilson was. Uh, he became a, uh, a, a, a laicist Republican who believed in the religious neutrality of the state, but he argued on the basis of, of, a, of a thesis in moral philosophy which he advanced um, called uh, Moral Philosophy Adequately Considered, mm. that um, certain principles such as universal participation in the civil order and uh, inviolable human rights um, are not justifiable without uh, embracing Christianity. And therefore he concluded um, that if these principles were embodied in a confessionally neutral state, that state would be in a sense implicitly Christian. Mm. Um, and, uh, and and this was a philosophy he called integral humanism. And um, because he thought that the nation state is a natural entity, uh, he thought that uh, creating a civil order, specifically a European federation, that transcended the boundaries of the nation state would intrinsically uh, generate a implicit Christendom in a certain sense. So I think I, yeah. I, the exact words are something along the lines he says, a, a European federation conceived under the banner of liberty would already be, in its essence, a new Christendom. Um, and uh, Schumann was very influenced by Maritain's writings during the war, mm. which were, um, were the ones where he most clearly advanced this thesis, particularly a book called Christianity and Democracy, which Maritain... Uh, um, almost paraphrase, sorry not Maritain, Schumann almost paraphrases in his own writings. Um, and so L Leo's, uh, this modified and from some people's perspective, certain, or prob certainly Garrigou Lagrange and probably Gilson's perspective, um, uh, or not altogether orthodox reinterpretation of uh, um, Leo XIII's programme ended up becoming a uh, uh, a foundation of of the European communitarian movement, and how did Maritain change his position? 
in older age. I know he made, have you already discussed that change? Uh, he um, uh, he probably wasn't as enthusiastic about European federal proposals when they actually came into being mm. in the early 50s as he was during the war yeah. because they were being brought about by centre-right conservative parties as he would see it yes. um, uh, which he was he was not very enthusiastic about but they were enthusiastic about him yeah um now i, I would argue that schumann modified maritau's vision in a way that brought it back closer to leo the 13th's vision mm. but certainly integral humanism this philosophy of maritau's is is uh, crucial in as, as a background to the creation of the european institutions that's right what do you think now that this is speculative uh, how would Schumann view the European Union as it stands now? Well, the the, the way in which he he brought um, the way in which he 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 drew back integral humanism closer to Leo XIII's vision was that whereas Maritain seemed to hold that that there would be an, an almost automatic um, connaturality between uh, a, a European federation and um, the gospel. Um, Schumann uh, didn't seem to hold to this. He he held that 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 it required a lot of of, of evangelization and, mm. and and work to keep um, the Christian spirit alive in Western Europe in yeah. order to ensure that that harmony would exist. Um, he didn't think um, he didn't think that it would just exist automatically, and he thought that if it, if it, if if that spade work wasn't occurring then yeah. in fact as something of a nightmare would begin to develop uh, as something that would be simultaneously tyranny and anarchy is how he describes it so he did and and would you i'm just interested to explore this while we're while we're there i mean surely he would look at the 70 plus years of i mean what was very much on their mind was to create to, to destroy that dangerous uh, nationalism which had torn europe apart and so he would be happy to see the peace, um, countries working together, human rights efforts. Is there anything that would cause him alarm now if well, he was to be exhumed and to <laughs> walk into Europe again? Well, he, um, he even raised the prospect of supranational egotism. Yes. Uh, uh, because he saw, he, he even said a very bold statement, a Europe is... Uh, a generalized democracy in the Christian sense of the term, yes. and that is a that is a um, uh, very much sums up Maritain's view. Mm. Um, but he he felt that so he felt that, that that there was a kind of supernatural charity which transcended the egotism of the individual and also transcended the egotism of the nation, and um, and and that was what Europe was supposed to be all about. But unlike Maritain, he didn't think that was automatic. So he thought that if you took away um, the gospel, what you'd end up with would be a kind of a, a super state that, that, that had the same, he even used the term Leviathan, yes. um, the term for Thomas Hobbes's yes. totalitarian contractualist state in the 7th century, 17th century. Um, and, and he seemed to think that uh, that this could end up, that, that, that the European institutions could just end up being another one of these, a sort of unnatural nationalism mm. super nationalism instead of instead of just a instead of a uh, uh, nature gone wrong it would be kind of nature perverted and gone wrong so yeah. so in a way it would be worse than um worse than what what he was the problem he was trying to solve and it's clear that he agreed with gilson um that um he agreed with gilson that uh that a confessional state was ultimately a legitimate goal. He talks about um, he talks about a numerical preponderance of believers making uh, a confessional um, uh, loyalty on the part of the state legitimate. He 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 said that was not really conceivable uh, in 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 any foreseeable future in regard to the European institutions. Um, but that didn't mean that he was surrendering it as an abstract theoretical goal. Mm. Whereas Maritain was surrendering it as an abstract theoretical goal. It's a very, very delicate yeah, distinction. Yes, it is. Okay. And are you happy to talk about right, the concepts of Europe within Catholic thought? So this is a bit of a specialism, isn't it, in a way? 
Um, you were going to talk about Belloc. What did Belloc say? It's a Hilaire Belloc, who we know in England, but perhaps don't you know know about his his incredible Frenchness. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had he was very dogmatic and firm on his opinions of European history and most things. Yeah, and most yeah, as was the Times. So his words were. Well, he he said that the history of European civilization is the history of a certain political institution which united and expressed Europe and was centered on Rome, mm -hmm. um, and and essentially he argued that that uh, Europe simply is the society uh, which was identified with the Church in the Middle Ages, and in his views, in so far as it had ceased to be identified with it, had simply fallen prey to dissolution. Consequently, famous sees Europe is the church, and the church is Europe, and also Europe is the faith, and the faith is Europe. Those are two. two. And what about um, an Anglican? About T. S. Eliot? You, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, he had a quite an interesting sort of uh, way of it, describing the synthesis of cultures that made up. He he in in a in a in a in a, in a, a an address which he gave on the BBC to Germany during the war, just after the unity of European culture. Um, he argued that Europe is essentially composed of uh, Greece, Rome, and Israel. It's a synthesis of, of those three elements, and that um, and that uh, the Enlightenment and uh, anti-clerical and anti-Christian forces in European culture uh, remain in intrinsically European because they identify themselves in in contrast to that synthesis of Greece, Rome, and Israel. And a, and a, but are essentially parasitic and, and, and incomprehensible apart from that synthesis. So yeah. you'd see people like Voltaire and Nietzsche yes. as, as ultimately completely uh, European, but because they define themselves in opposition to the essence of European culture. Yes. But I mean, there's no getting around the fact that the term Europe it precisely arises as a sort of a rallying point or a label for the highest level of civilizational unity in the West as a as a secular alternative to Christendom. Mm. So so that the use of the term Europe is at once a sign of secularization and also a, uh, a geographically inaccurate expression in the sense that the civilization of the West is a Mediterranean civilization, not a geographically European civilization yeah. for whom uh, African authors um, such mm. as uh, Athanasius, Plotinus, um, Augustine, uh, Augustine are, are immensely significant, and of mm. course, um, uh, Christianity is an Asian religion, not yes. a European one. That's right. And uh, is Eliot say that? Uh, oh no, this is Tom Holland, isn't it? Saying that if you, his, he's a historian, mm -hmm. saying that if you, the main ingredient, the ultimate. The, the, the larger flavour that makes up the ingredients, these three ingredients, makes up the whole, is is the he Hebraic. Yes. Um, so the Christian, um, the Christian influence. If you took away the others, it would be. Yeah, Tom Holland is is in a way reflecting from an agnostic perspective the same similar thesis to Belloc and, and Eliot's thesis, uh, in that he's arguing that uh, that although. Greek and Roman civilization are absolutely essential to, to Western civilization. We would find those civilizations before they entered into synthesis with Christianity and therefore with the Jewish tradition through um, uh, Christ. Um, we would find them immensely alien mm. and, and strange to us um, in a way that we, we never do once that synthesis has occurred. Once, once Judaism has been brought into synthesis with those two elements in Christianity. Um, uh, it, it, we we recognise this may be us in a very different phase of our history, and us uh, we, we, in, a, in a very different, a very different uh, phase of, of our opinions and, and development. But it's still us in a way in a way that the that the pagan Greeks and the pagan Romans mm. just aren't us. Yes, something about. I, I suppose that these foundational doctrines, uh, understandings of human exceptionalism, the, the idea of a creation, your place under in a created order, so human exceptionalism. Did I mention that just then? Um, but I also see. on uh, the same thing as Maritain was saying, the unlimited moral obligations in the sense of, of every man is my neighbour. Yeah, that, that's what's that not, extension not never known. never yeah. happens. Yes, yeah, that's interesting in, in Greco-Roman culture. 
slavery and infanticide um, the, these these express a, a closed in yeah. um, a closed in limited set of moral obligations. The list of obligations may be the same to some extent, mm. but 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 who they apply to is is very different. Yes, the application. Well, I think what we're going to do is the light is is fading, and we should um, we should just pack up our things and go. How's it looking there, good lad? Go and stick. Go and press that button now. If you enjoyed this episode, then please show your appreciation with a comment and perhaps even subscribing to the channel. If you have questions, drop them below. And if you want to go deeper into the subject, then please check out the Saving Europe book and the other videos on the channel, especially the Book Distillery podcast, where me and my blue collar scholar friends go deeper into these very subjects with top academic guests from around the world. So until next time, thanks for watching.